can registered nurses actually give people access to prescriptions over the phone and there are barriers um, in how that occurs. So we'll talk about that. I just want to indicate that laws can change quickly. We did this uh, project over the course of about 12 months and laws can also be interpreted differently. So since we conducted this work, a law may change tomorrow and I may not be representing that. Today I'm going to talk about what we are calling the 50 state assessment of laws and policies that impact the feasibility of registered nurse triage and prescription via telephone lines. And really, uh, when we started working with Lisa's team about a year ago, she really wanted to find out three key things. Can registered nurses give triage advice over the phone? Can they, give, uh, can they provide access to prescription medications? And if so, do that over the phone. And can they work across state lines? We used standard procedures to develop legal questions, write a methodology about how we would conduct the work, how we would find the laws and the policies, we formulated a protocol for research assistants to follow, and then we created a code book and, and will be summarizing results in about um, a month or two. So some considerations, and I stress these one at a time because they are all actually very important. So the concept of laws on the books versus laws on the streets. I and my team went through several laws and several and pandemic flu plans and, and nurse practice acts and other things to see what states were saying about their the authority, the ability to register for registered nurses to work in this type of setting and do the types of things that we're talking about today. But then there's laws in the streets. That's actually what people do, regardless of what the law says. So if I tell you something that's going on, and uh, if I tell you something about the authority in the state of Texas, um, and then you know one of you might raise your hand and say, that's not how we do it in Texas. We do this. That may very well be true for many of the states we're going to talk about today. Across the country, registered nurses um, are different than advanced practice registered nurses. And advanced practice registered nurses in many states can practice independently up to the full ability of their scope and their training. So in some states, nurse practitioners or maybe, I don't know, a clinical nurse specialist, maybe a nurse midwife, could actually do the things that I'm talking about today uh, for, with registered nurses in that relationship. So these were the legal questions that we started with last year. Can they provide triage? Can they provide access to prescription medication over the phone? Can an emergency declaration temporar temporarily expand our in scope of practice? That's actually a very important question. And how do they work across state lines? We looked specifically in only three areas of law, Nurse Practice Acts and corresponding regulations, Physician Practice Acts and corresponding regulation, and Emergency Management Laws and corresponding regulation. In the state of Kentucky, and in, and in fact in 50 states across the country and Washington, D.C., RNs can provide triage over the phone without question. This is just sort of a standard thing that registered nurses do as part of their practice. Um, for question number two, can RNs provide access to prescription medication over the phone? Well, this is where things got a little challenging in every state. Well, I'll show you a, a broader example of what I'm saying in a minute. But for Kentucky specifically, can, the, we had to think about whether registered nurses can work under a broad protocol to prescribe medication. Under what conditions and if they can do that over the phone? Well, in both situations, they can't do it. There is a Kentucky uh, nurse advisory opinion that basically states specifically they cannot do this work. Could a declared emergency set the stage for an expansion of our in scope of practice? Yes, it can. And in fact, in every state across the country, it can. So can registered nurses from other states work in, in a, a base state, we call it a base state, without being licensed in base state? In the state of Kentucky, Kentucky is a nurse licensure compact state. We talked about this a little bit in the last session. Nurses from li licensure compact states can work over state lines without being licensed in that other state. So in the state of Kentucky, um, if an RN wanted to work in the state of Kentucky, if they were from another nurse, li nurse licensure compact state, they, they could. However, there are still about 25 states out there that are not a member of this compact. 
So in that situation, they could only practice in the state of Kentucky during a declared emergency. And that uh, authority is from the Emergency Management Assistant Compact in the state of Kentucky, which is actually a compact that all 50 states and Washington, D.C. belong to. What's interesting about Washington State, and this takes us back to that laws on the books versus laws on the streets thing, it's my understanding, and I, I can't verify this, um, I can't say for sure that this would be true, but what I'm hearing is that even though that there's a nurse advisory opinion that says nurses can work under a broad protocol and, do, and prescribe over the phone, generally, um, that it won't be enforced, that they won't follow that rule. Why? I don't know. But what I do know is they have a nurse advisory opinion that says that they can do so. This is where it gets good because so <laughs> there's all these there's all these um, seeming barriers and so I'm sure all of you are thinking about okay so if I was going to go back to my state and argue that we should use nurse triage lines to provide access to prescription medications potentially antivirals um, so people could stay home if they're sick but still get the drugs that they need how would we make that happen well. Under an emergency declaration is how you would make that happen. Literally every state in the country and Washington, D.C. gives the governor or some other authority, for many of these states it's the governor, the green states it's the governor and at least the governor, perhaps a second authority. The three yellow are somebody besides the governor but not the governor, and I can take questions about that later if anyone actually has any questions. Um, and then I, we did find this sort of interesting designation that I just wanted to present to as an, as an example to all of you today, that there are some states out there, Nevada and Arizona for instance, where the governor can actually delegate to someone else the power or the ability to remove scope of practice barriers during an emergency. And in all of these states, there's some language on the book that says, in an emergency declaration, during an emergency, rules, regulations, laws, anything that gets in the way of getting people the care that they need during an emergency can be lifted for, this, for the time period that the emergency continues in that state. It's different in some, some states it's 72 hours, sometimes it's till the governor says it's over, but the point is every state you can do this under an emergency declaration. So the big question, do nurse practitioners have prescription authority for controlled substances? And the answer, our initial findings are that 48 states and the District of Columbia allow nurse practitioners prescription authority for controlled substances. That is, Alabama and Florida do not appear to allow nurse practitioners to have any prescription authority for controlled substances. We found in about 15 states they use the lang language of collaborative relationship. And here's an example from the state of Connecticut where it states, APRNs may, in collaboration with a physician, prescribe, dispense, and administer medical therapeutics. And what does collaboration mean? It's a mutually agreed upon relationship between the APRN and the physician. And it has to be in writing. And it shall address the level of Schedule II and three controlled substances that the APRN may prescribe. And really, to highlight that, we looked at the laws and what do they say, and we find, for example, in Arkansas and many other states, um, the, the use of the language collaborative agreement or collaborative practice agreement. And here you see, in Arkansas, the Board of Nursing may grant a certificate of prescriptive authority to an APN who has a collaborative practice agreement with a physician. And what does the collaborative practice agreement have? It must have provisions that address for example, include the protocols for prescriptive authority. Other states use the language of protocol. Must An APRN may prescribe drugs pursuant to a written protocol, and this written protocol shall have, it specifies the class of drugs for classes of disease or injury. It must be maintained in a book and contain the name, the telephone number, the signature of the APRN, and the date, the last time it was reviewed and adopted, and also, it has to be located at where the APRN is practicing. We found that in 27 states, the laws state that there needs to be some sort of educational or training requirement. In addition, we're not talking about the education needed to maintain your APRN or nurse practitioner license. We're talking specific to prescription authority. Um, and here you have an example of Indiana, which says that the APN may be authorized to prescribe controlled substances if the APN submits proof of having successfully completed a graduate level pharmacology course within five years of applying for this certificate of prescription authority. Now, if you don't have that, you have uh, several other options. You could have completed at least 30 actual contact hours of continuing education, 
but that has to be two years preceding. Then you've got also at least eight of those hours have to be contact hours of pharmacology and prescript or prescriptive experience in another state that you're bringing in because you've moved to a new state. Answering the question of do nurse practitioners have prescription authority for controlled substances is, is not a simple yes or no. There, we need to unpack, unpack the question on various levels and looking at things like the role that the physician plays, the written agreement. What does the written agreement say? What, have, you know, what, has, what has the discussion been between the physician and the APRN, and what have they put down in writing in terms of prescription authority for controlled substances? Particular, are there particular schedules mentioned? What is mentioned? And then ultimately, the law also places limitations in the actual law saying that, you know, the scope of authority of in this state shall be for nurse practitioners to prescribe uh, schedule two um, prescription drugs shall only be for 30 day, a 30-day supply with no refills. So things like that that we have to keep in mind. Because we're looking at supply chain all the way from creation to manufacture to distribution to dispense to prescribe to the usage of drugs, um, it's necessarily very much impacted by the status of state laws. This is why we're looking at state laws. And outside of these prescribing practices, we've looked at a whole host of other legal domains that may or may not, depending on the state, impact how a re-engineering of this system is, is, is rolled out into different states. So what are we talking about? When we look at, at, at supply chain or life cycle of uh, pharmaceuticals, be they antibiotics, antivirals, could even be opiate drugs. Here we're concerned mainly with antibiotics, antivirals. We're really looking at several, several touch points with state laws. Number one is distribution permits. So wholesale distribution, when you're moving tractor trailer loads of drugs through a state, state laws impact that. The second area are pedigree laws. So how is it, what are the mechanisms that we have in place and what are the mechanisms that we require people to do? What, what do we make people do to track these drugs through their life? We do this because sometimes we have to go backwards, right? If you think of the fungal meningitis outbreak. We had to go backwards, and we want to have things in place so that we can efficiently go backwards and see who took what, where did it come from, all the way back to the manufacturing point. This generally, across the states and the nation, is called pedigree. So we keep the pedigree, it's like pedigree of dogs. You, we keep that pedigree so that we can go backwards at some point. Of course, labels are very important. Here we're really talking primarily about the labels that are on the bottles that you take home to your house. Um, those labels and the things that, all those stickers that you find on them um, with the little drawings and things, the bleary-eyed guy, it's going to make you tired, don't drive the car. Those things are very heavily regulated. And what we found is that those label requirements vary from state to state. This can impact how we bring in pharmaceuticals very rapidly. Think about the city's readiness initiative. Prophylax your population in 48 hours. Maybe you're not going to be able to get all those labeling requirements met in 48 hours and get the drugs into people's mouths. So these labeling requirements, number one, heavily regulated, and number two, could impede, in some sense, uh, a rapid response. And the other thing that we've looked at is this, this authority to waive. Uh, uh, Jamie and Akshar have mentioned it. We started looking at those as well. So I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on these. So distributor licenses. Here again, what we're talking about, we're talking about wholesale distribution. Every state in the nation requires wholesale distributors to have a license. They've got to have some sort of piece of paper that gives them permission to engage in these activities. This is potentially a pinch point for mass distribution. We have a system that has a certain size pipeline, and, and it's, it's based on market, and it's, it's based on business models, and it's based on the market demanding a certain amount, and we can put a certain amount of drugs through that pipeline because they're getting bought and used on the other end. Well, all of a sudden, if the demand on the other side becomes so much greater, you're going to have to widen that pipeline. Well, that pipeline is permitted. 
And so if we need more drugs moved in, you may be talking about moving drugs through distribution channels that are not permitted. This was something that came up in several states and impeded progress in moving antiviral medications through the country during H1N1. It's a lesson learned, and we want to see exactly how wholesale distribution permits could impact the movement of pharmaceuticals during an emergency. And what we found is that this idea of wholesaler is very broadly defined. So in one scenario, it could be like, well, we're going to very narrowly define wholesaler such that emergency distribution would not be covered, and it wouldn't be a problem. We found just the opposite, that wholesaler is very broadly defined, and so in most circumstances, this activity we're talking about, expanding that pipeline, bringing in excess pharmaceuticals to meet the demand of the emergency, <laughs> probably going to be covered by these state laws. But what we did find uh, and at least the numbers indicate at this point, about 19 states have various ways to waive that wholesale distribution requirement. So it's possible that we could look to some of those states to either, one, create guidance on what those, those waivers are, and other states could look at it and say, okay, if this is going to get in the way of me in my state, mass distributing pharmaceuticals in emergency. Maybe I, maybe I should look at these other states as an example how I could change my laws. Or for, those, for the non-19, they could say, well, maybe I could take care of this with some post-order, post-emergency order to change the landscape. Pedigree laws are a little bit different in that we have pedigree laws at the federal level. So the question becomes, what's the difference at the state level? And are there additional requirements at the state level on top of federal? Because if it's federal, if it's nothing but federal rules, and we're moving SNS assets under a federal declaration, well, maybe the states don't have to worry about the federal. Maybe, maybe at the federal level, in one action, we could take care of those rules and get them waived somehow or decide not to follow them. But if there are additional requirements at the state level as we move those drugs in, are we creating barriers at the state level by having to mark additional requirements as they're moving through the system, which then slows the system down, and you move from prophylaxing your population from 48 hours to 96 hours because you're having to go through all these bureaucratic hoops? So this is the question. But 19 states, uh, at this so far we found 19 states that have a way to uh, waive or exceptions to those pedigree requirements. We think there probably at some point in the past was a, was a model law that was taken up. If it was, it was pretty, pretty long ago um, because the exceptions look similar uh, across the states. Um, and then interestingly, and we're still trying to figure out exactly what this means, um, 16 of those 19 have an exemption for emergency medical reasons that'll take you out of those pedigree requirements. So we're still trying to get a fix on what we think those emergency medical reasons might be, whether or not that's just for you personally. You are having an emergency. I want to give you a drug, and I'm not going to write all this extra stuff down. Or if it could be construed more broadly to mean emergency medical reasons for the whole population, for a whole metropolitan statistical area in a CRI uh, uh, scenario whether it's very narrow or very broad, not clear yet. Every single state, so all 50 states, have at least one extra labeling requirement that they make people add on to it. Um, and so, in, and they went, they went up in number, um, and, but they varied greatly. And so from one state to the next, I mean, there's things like uh, name of the manufacturer, the packer or the distributor of the medicine has to be on the bottle, the name or initials of the dispensing pharmacist, the expiration date, the telephone number of the distributing pharmacy, the reasons and the medical conditions requiring the prescription medication, the refill requirements, the patient's address, and possibly in some states, the dispenser's license number. All 50 states give some variety of authority to the governor or other state level official in DC, it's a city level official, the mayor, um, give some level of authority to waive regulatory requirements. Um, and 
it really becomes, um, the trick really becomes not can you do this, but, but what do you do? What do you wave? And in what way do you wave it? Um, so, you, you know, one of the things that we're looking at, and, and this gets back to the question of, you know, what are we going to do with all this information? I think what our, you know, our goal is to provide guidance to emergency planners in the state. Um, this is really what it comes down to. We've got to plan for these things. None of this stuff happens automatically. So as, as Jamie suggested earlier, the declaration of a state of emergency simply sets the stage for other actions. Those other actions are defined by state law. But those things don't happen necessarily just because you declare an emergency. The, the emergency just sets the stage. And so you've actually got to, if you're, if you're a governor, if you're a mayor in D.C., you've actually got to issue something else. There has to be some other statement coming from your authority to say, this is what we're going to waive. This is when we are going to waive it. And this is when it expires. Or on the positive or the affirmative side, this is going to be the new rule. And this is when this new rule is going to take effect. And this is when this new rule is going to expire. That takes planning.